Hello, you're watching the Telecom TV Summit on Private 5G and The Edge. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content. And I'm delighted to say that joining me on the programme today is Jim Brismitsis, who is founder and general partner of the 5G Open Innovation Lab. Hi, Jim. It's really good to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us once more. Now, the Open Innovation Lab has been going for what, about three years now? And, you know, it started with the aim of creating a collaborative environment for 5G related startups and also the ecosystem and bring them together with investors. What stage are you at now? Um, are you where you perhaps hoped you would be? Uh, thank you, Guy, for the invitation to be part of today's um, interview. Um, I, I think I think we're a little ahead of where we anticipated and and the future is, is quite bright. So we started in earnest on uh, in the summer of 2019 and launched our first batch on May 4th of 2020. So we're in our, our fourth year of operation this year. Uh, just two weeks ago, we launched our seventh batch of 14 teams. In total, we've had 101 teams come through the program. Those teams have collectively raised north of $1.641 billion in venture capital. And we've grown our partner base up to now 18 partners, including um, international CSPs. And we are delighted to uh, announce um, SK Telecom joining uh, in the summer, or rather the fall of last year. And just two weeks ago, we announced that EN, uh, formerly known as Atel Salat, has now joined the program as well. Well, it's really great to hear. And, um, you know, that's, that's a lot of companies you've got through the program already. So that's fantastic. Now, part of this ecosystem of innovation that you've created are enterprise businesses. And given that this is Telecom TV's private 5G summit, what's the level of interest that you are seeing in this particular sector with regards to private 5G networks and apps? Yeah, so that's um, that's a great question. Let's break it into two sort of areas. Um, I think it's probably safe to say that in early 2020, um, I think COVID had helped really accelerate the interest. Certainly in 2021 and 22, we have seen more and more enterprises um, proverbially kicking the tires on private 5G solutions, more because they've reached the limits and capabilities of what's possible with Wi-Fi. Uh, to be clear, I don't think Wi-Fi ever goes away. I think it coexists quite well uh, with, with private cellular over time. And um, what I have seen and what I've also read in, in from an analyst perspective is that 2023 to 2024 is really where uh, private 5G network starts to go mainstream. So from that standpoint, um, I think that industry has hobbled along in a, in a very positive way. And I do think we're going to see a lot more activity and proof of concepts turning into paid engagements and eventually solutions that are being uh, adopted and implemented by enterprises. So that said, then the question becomes, well, now that these networks are constructed, what are enterprises doing with them? And there is a bit of a lag in the industry from the standpoint of there aren't enough standalone 5G capable advices to, to devices today. Uh, as you know, there's a plethora of 4G LTE connected devices, but the number of available devices that, that do have support for 5G, uh, and certainly devices that have support um, for standalone 5G, in addition to uh, MIOT and such, they're, they're still relatively we're, we're relatively new in that area. And so I think over time, uh, the device marketplace will start to catch up as well, and we'll see what we've always seen in every new generation of standards from 3G to 4G now to 5G is that that catch up will actually marry quite well with where the industry is, and then you'll see significant growth from there. So. From the standpoint of where devices are, that's actually quite important. From an application standpoint, then, that uses these devices for the development of data and uh, access to that data and analysis of that data and all that such, um, we're seeing a very healthy amount of interest uh, in that from the companies that we've worked with, whether it's in big data, computer vision startups, um, robotics, IoT, obviously, uh, drones. We're seeing a healthy amount of interest in that world. So. I think it's safe to say that the, the, the software ecosystem anticipates that there's going to be a, a fairly big and sizable market in, in private cellular here in the next three to five years quite easily. In, in turn, they also expect that there's going to be a number of new devices coming into the marketplace that's going to make um, truly those two uh, platforms come together in a big way. Um, and we haven't talked about edge computing, which um, I think is going to be a significant opportunity 
uh, as well. And so you bring those three big opportunities together, and I, and I think the enterprise IT landscape is going to change significantly from how we see it today to where we know it's going to go in the future. That's really interesting, Jim. You know, it's great to hear that the the, the apps developer community is anticipating this this growth because we are in early days of, of 5G and we, we've got more SA to come along. We've, we've got more devices that we, we need to see in the market. Um, at the moment, though, you know, from our perspective, we see a lot of interest in private 5G coming from specific verticals and, and those that have got either large geographical operations such as mining or big factories or, or something or, 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 or uh, big facilities they need to cover. Um, it's quite specific and focused and it's not a broad market reach yet. Is this an inherent problem or, or even a characteristic of, of 5G or is it just purely the fact that it's early days for private 5G um, and, and the potential at the moment is, is quite small? Um, I, I think it's a great question. I, I think that there are a number of forces at play here. Um, from an enterprise buyer's perspective, uh, there's no line delineation between 5G and wireless or Wi-Fi. It's all wireless at the end of the day for them. So their, um, their mode of acquiring wireless solutions, i.e. Wi-Fi, has been simplified over many, 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 many years. And so for them, it's really easy. They find a vendor they like, whether it be a Ubiquiti or Aruba or whomever, um, and they, they frankly just deploy those access points, integrate them into their security stacks and networks, and they're off and running. That, that motion is very different, as you can imagine, in 5G. It's not as simple. You have a lot more um, products to buy and integrate as well. And I also think that the world has, is short on um, an available number of radio players. Here in the United States, we have a handful of various radio players, and trying to get your hands on some radios becomes uh, is a challenge. It's, it's really hard to do that. Um, I think if there's an influx of new players in the radio side, on the core side, there's a healthy amount of interest, a lot of solutions. In fact, we are very fortunate to work with six startups that have been providing and building private uh, cellular platforms, cores and such, and more to come. So uh, from that standpoint, I think it's just been a little bit harder for enterprises to get into the cellular game because one, the integration is, is much tougher than it, they're used to in Wi-Fi. It's not insurmountable and it will, it'll get better over time, but it is a hurdle that they're not anticipating. And two, if you're looking to buy access points um, and actually construct and integrate and run these private 5G networks, it's, it's a little bit of a heavy lift for a smaller environment. When you talk about big stadiums and mines, uh, warehouses, ports and such, that lift is worth it because the alternative is fairly weak Wi-Fi access points that really don't provide much coverage. So the pain is much harder, or much higher. Uh, and so that, therefore, you see a lot more engagements in those bigger areas. Um, I've had a chance to meet with, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had a chance to meet with a number of CIOs who are in distribution and warehousing and such. And, um, you know, they're, they're getting to that point where they're exploring and, and demonstrating <clears throat> the value of private 5G networks and starting to make those investments. And so I, you're absolutely right. You're, you're, I, I do see that there's a number of bigger installations that are out there and that's actually helped us seed the market in a big way. Uh, <clears throat> I think that market will continue to expand and grow as the locations get a little smaller as well. That's, uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, and you mentioned, Jim, earlier about the, the potential of the edge. And ever since we started talking about the edge, we've been hearing about these future low latency applications and services that are going to be coming along um, and how these will be enabled by a combination of 5G and edge deployments. Are they actually emerging though? And are telco capable low latency apps still of interest to, to startups? If, if you don't mind, Guy, I'm gonna be slightly provocative and I, I mean no ill intents. I really just wanna spark a discussion in this industry. Uh, for, for many, many years, the industry has been concerned about uh, you know, their, their value in this ecosystem. Uh, oftentimes, they, other people have referred to them as a dumb pipe. Um, there are three forces that are coming together that is is quite transformative for this industry, so much so that, uh, you know, we built the 5G Open Innovation Lab to coalesce this ecosystem so that carriers can see that there's this really interesting and very prosperous path forward that they could fundamentally change, you know, who they are today in, into the services and the foundations and platforms they build in the future. Those three things include the cloudification of their networks and in that mode to, cl mode to cloudification, they have this uh, advantage that's unique to CSPs. They have spectrum and they have locations. Here in the United States, um, I believe T-Mobile supports over 7,000 points of presence 
and a very, very, very well positioned spectrum strategy. Well, in, in the edge, which is where the market is going, um, you really need compute and connectivity. Those, those are two critical ingredients for any applications to really run and take advantage of this latency um, proof sort of network and operation. And on top of that, you have a, a fairly big uh, push uh, from the application ecosystem. It has nothing to do with CSPs and it has nothing, frankly, to do with the cloud vendors. But there's a very big push from application developers to Kubernetes and microservices architectures. Well, when you bring those three together, it's, it's the perfect storm. So if I'm a CSP today and I'm looking at billions and billions of dollars of investment in CapEx to go build this network, only to retire that CapEx spend against ARPU that is primarily um, connectivity based, then the question is, well, where else could I generate net new revenue? And more importantly, how can I transform my network so that my network is an active participant in the software ecosystem? Well, that the answer is the edge. That, that is where it is. So for a CSP, finding their way closest to where the application ecosystem is how they differentiate and how they eventually stay with times, um, because that's essentially where you know the, the market is going. It's these applications that create these, these experiences. And in my humble opinion, being as close to providing services in those application worlds beyond connectivity uh, is, is a much better trajectory longer term. My fear is that you know we, we use 5G and talk about latency and uh, machine to machine and all that fun stuff in the spirit of connectivity, which is again, fantastic, but we miss out on this opportunity of, of the edge. Jim, your, your passion is so apparent, as we would expect, um, uh, so apparent here in, in, in this area. And it's a very clear message that you, you gave to CSPs there um, and one that we really hope they're, they're going to heed. Um, I'd like to ask you a final question, though, um, and, and that is, you know, what's happening now? What are you most excited about that, that's going on? What's happening in the 5G Open Innovation Lab that's, that's giving you the most encouragement? On the CSP front, we, we have worked with a number of startups that have, monetize, we believe, monetizing uh, services today. And so the use case catalog that we're in the works of building is really about harnessing a lot of those teams and demonstrating monetization capabilities so that over time, CSPs have a library of monetizable services. And when we say monetizable services, it's not just, a, hey, hey, CSP, go work with this startup, but working with our partners um, like Amdocs and Ericsson and Nokia to, to make the monetization of that service and the implementation of those services and use cases into the carrier's networks really, really easy. So that's a big ambitious goal of ours. Um, but now with 100, 101 teams, we'll likely bring on another 12 to 14 teams here in September. So we'll get closer to 120 teams this year. But as, as we continue chugging along, now we want to trans, um, transform all of those great startups and partnerships that we've worked hard to build here in the last three years and put it into production. Uh, so applied innovation. Um, we like the shiny objects and innovation of startups, and it's all wonderful. But if those shiny objects aren't really solving big problems at scale, then they're just shiny objects. And we want to move further away from the shiny objects and actually get into production and demonstrate that capability and hopefully make it much, much more easier for enterprises to uh, see a set of use cases that solve a number of their own problems and for CSPs to see a number of uh, monetizationable services that they could look at and potentially even deploy in their networks. So much going on. Jim, you've given us a lot to think about today, but we must leave it there for now. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you.